good morning. morning. Welcome to a kind of hazy, daisy, grazy day of winter here at the, at the cottage, but it's a beautiful day, kind of froggy out there. I want to welcome you to a uh, Sunday morning version of Jesus and Jeans Worship at the Cottage, and uh, that's what we're here to do. And uh, so uh, my name is Teddy Baker, along with my wife Jan and Jim and Sandra Pinner. This is our weekly ministry to you all, and we thank you uh, for joining us, especially if you're with us via the Internet. Um, we always uh, are, are so honored that you take time wherever you are to, uh, to join us during worship. Uh, we also have our, our YouTube channel where we archive all the messages, and that way you can uh, catch up anytime you want to. And so we thank you for that. We're going to do a little praise and worship series. We're going to do a, just a great old hymn this morning and then one of the more contemporary songs. Uh, but, uh, this is from my old Southern Baptist background here. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy be. The solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covered and his blood support me in the overwhelming flood. And all around my soul gives way, he then is all my Solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in the be found, rest in his righteousness alone, fall us to stand before the throne. A solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Sing that chorus. On Christ a solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand.
to lift up our friend Lou uh, Barbado. He's uh, better, but uh, recovery's still a little slow for him, and uh, so I want to pray for Lou and, and Maria as well, and uh, just uh, pray God's healing touch on, on his body. He's been through a, been through a lot, and, and Lou's in really good shape. I mean, yeah. you know, he doesn't have a chest like I do that's <laughs> down about a foot. <laughs> but uh, we love Lou and, and Maria both, and so we pray for them for sure. Uh, he said he watches us on live, so everybody say hello to Lou. Hello. Hey. <laughs> Want to uh, pray for Philip Ballard, uh, Jane's husband. He's going in for a procedure, uh, have, have a shot in his back uh, to try to ease some of the pain. And uh, buddy, I know how that is. I've had two of those, and uh, it is some kind of wonderful. <laughs> and uh, so we want to certainly want to pray for Philip and just pray that uh, some of the pain will be released. And uh, pray, continue to pray. Uh, for our, our friend uh, Dana and, and Tagi, Tagi passed away last week, and uh, they're having his uh, service tomorrow uh, out in uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and uh, so we just want to keep uh, Dana and her family uh, in our prayers. Uh, they're just lovely, lovely people. Uh, Tagi was only 48 years old, and uh, I thought he was a little older than that. And, uh, he was born in 1972, and I said, geez. <laughs> I got socks older than that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I certainly want to pray for Dana. She has our love and our, our hearts and our prayers for sure. Continue to pray for Bonnie and Howard. Bonnie, uh, uh, they uh, tested positive for uh, COVID, and uh, Bonnie had also had a bee sting that she's still uh, kind of dealing with and getting over. So I want to pray for them. Uh, Hans and Barbara uh, still recuperating. Uh, Hans, I, I pray, is getting a little better. Um, our friend, uh, uh, our, well, our friends Rod and, and Kathy Gibson, we always pray for Katie, uh, Rod's daughter, and uh, just a, a, her continued recovery uh, from cancer, and uh, uh, Kathy to, to continue to, to get stronger from, uh, she had a valve replacement, and uh, I think an oil change. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> a, so, uh, but anyway, we want, want to pray for Kathy and uh, get stronger. Uh, then our, our friends uh, Mark and, and Jane, uh, who are with us today, Mark and Jane Easton, uh, they, they have a neighbor who has a, a four-year-old son, Case, who uh, developed uh, just, uh, they thought he had a stomach virus, he started having problems with his kidney, went to his brain, his brain now is, is swelled to the point that there's not really any activity, and uh, just out of nowhere. Um, and so prognosis doesn't look good right now but we want to continue to pray for this family and uh, pray for case k-a-s-e four years old and we just pray god's healing touch on him. uh mark has a, a friend in alabama uh roll tide uh, i knew i was going to do it i mean I, I, so i beat you to it so but Mark has a friend in Alabama uh, whose 18-year-old daughter uh, has, has been diagnosed with uh, stage 2 ovarian cancer and just had a stomach ache and went in and found a, a tumor about the, the size of an orange. And uh, so uh, a treatment, they're looking at what type of, type of treatment on that. Um, anybody else? Uh, yeah, Kathy. Okay. Oh, wow. oh, yeah. Catherine's brother. All right. Michael. And, uh, Michael. Well, they're in Ohio. So, yes. <laughs> the country. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I certainly want to continue to pray for our nation and, and pray for our leaders. And uh, uh, again, that we would be one nation under God. That's the only way we're going to get out of this game. It's, it's not political parties. It's not political pundits. It's not news. It's not good news, fake news, no news, it's, it's none of that. 
And it is us as a people coming back to being one nation under God. Uh, that's what we were established on. That's what we were founded on. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it's just, uh, don't, I don't care which side of the fence you're on. Uh, I'm on God's side. And that's what I'm praying for. That, that, that this is. And uh, I love y'all. I don't, I, don't, I don't care who you vote for. You, you, know, you vote for a dog catcher. I don't care. <laughs> I love y'all. Let's pray together. And then, Father, uh, we add to this prayer list uh, just a, a, a very needed unspoken prayer request. And we want to put that at the top of our list today. We just pray for healing and for comfort, for peace, uh, for all the things, God. And, and I really, I try not to... Uh, to take these things for granted, I don't speak lightly of these things. Uh, sometimes we have to just because of the seriousness of everything that we're facing. And so, Father, for all of these prayer requests, we lift them to you today, praying, believing that you will intervene and only the way that you can. We know that you can. We pray that you will and that you would offer every needed situation. Peace, healing, touch, protection, whatever it is, God, you know better than we. We certainly pray for our nation and pray for our leaders. We pray that, God, somehow that you would break through all of the chaos and uh, all of the things that we see, all the violence, all the protests and all of that. And somehow, Father, that, that you would establish us once again as a, a nation under you, that you would raise up leaders who have a heart for you first and foremost, and that you would give them guidance and leadership to lead us out of uh, not only a pandemic, but uh, a pandemic of the heart. We love you, Lord. We pray for our message today. Come, Holy Spirit. We invite you to come into this place. Come into our hearts and our lives. Change us from the inside out. Make us better prepared to engage the world around us that people might be able to see Jesus in us. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for every single day that you give us. We pray your blessings in the most powerful name of your son, Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, we've been in, uh, for the last several weeks, we've been in a, a series on the study of the book of 1 John in the New Testament. It's one of my favorite books, small book, only five chapters, but it has such powerful messages about how we can live uh, the life that God actually planned for us to live. And John has just done a wonderful job in laying all of this out. And uh, so today we're going to be in 1 John chapter 5. And so if you want to got your Bibles, you want to go ahead and turn there. And I'll give you the scriptures in just a few moments. One time a doctor told uh, one of his patients, he says, I'm afraid you only have three weeks to live. Okay, then, the patient replied, I'll take the last two weeks of July and the week between Christmas and New Year. <laughs> you know, it really is kind of true that people want to have the time of their lives in the time that they have left. Amen. Yeah, we all want to enjoy life. The question is, how do we do that? How do we, how, how can you really live? How can you really enjoy a full life? How can you actually have the life? I'd like for you to consider what Dave Barry has to say about this. Dave Barry is a nationally syndicated columnist now in his 70s. And he's gained a lot of wisdom over the years. And some time ago, he wrote a column called Things It Took Me 50 Years to Learn. I want to share five of them with you this morning. The first is never under any circumstances take a sleeping pill and a laxative on the same night. <laughs> Second, if you had to identify in one word the reason why the human race has not achieved and never will achieve its full potential, that word would be meetings. 
<laughs> Can I get an amen, Sandra? <laughs> Scooter. This is the next one for all the vineyard owners in here. That, number three, there is a very fine line between hobby and mental illness. <laughs> <laughs> And fourth, this is one of my favorites, number four, because I've actually done this, Never, number four, never lick a steak knife. <laughs> Hate it when that happens. And then finally, a person who is nice to you but rude to the waiter is not a nice person. Amen. Amen. That's pretty good advice. But I, I think, again, that we can do better. And so that's why we're going to look at the Bible today. And again, I invite you to turn to 1 John chapter 5, where the Bible tells us how to have the life that God promised us. In 1 John 5, we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 12. And this is from the uh, English Standard Version. And I want to read these for you. It says this. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son, the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony that God gives us, eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life, literally the life. What did Jesus say? He said, I am the way, the truth, and what? The and the life. And so that's the life that they're talking about. He says, whoever does not have the Son of God does not have the life. So do you want to have the life? Then you must have the Son. <laughs> and if you want to have the Son, then there are two important steps that I want to share with you this morning that every single one of us must take. The first step is this. Believe. Believe. You must believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Not just a great prophet, not just a, a wonderful teacher, not just a peace, love, and water bitch kind of guy. But Jesus as the Son of God. That is to say that we depend on Christ as our Lord and Savior. We trust Him to be our leader in life and our liberator from sin. So first, we believe in Jesus as God Himself in the flesh. 1 John 5.5 5 says, Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is is the Son of God. And to say that Jesus is the Son of God is to say that He is literally God. See, in Bible days, when people wanted to describe the nature of someone, they would often use the phrase, Son of. For example, Judas was called the Son of Destruction in John 17, 12, because he was destructive by nature. Does that make sense? That, that was his character. That was his nature. And he was headed for destruction. Joseph, in the book of Acts, was called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement in Acts 4.36. Because he always was encouraging somebody. He encouraged the church in Jerusalem by selling 
all of his land and giving the proceeds of the sale to the church. He encouraged Paul, who was first rejected by the church, to become a worldwide missionary and church planner. He encouraged John Mark, a washout in ministry. And Paul says, I don't even want Mark to come with me. Mark was a kind of a weak, kind of a frail guy, and he was just a total washout in ministry. But he encouraged John Mark to become a leader in the first century church and the writer of one of our gospels, the gospel of Mark. Barnabas was called the son of encouragement because he was an encourager by nature. In the same way, Jesus is called the son of God because he is in his very nature, God himself. He is God in the flesh. A writer by the name of Stephen Smith wrote a book called Dying to Preach. And so he describes Jesus incarnate this way. He says, while Christ took on the form of a human, he set aside his rights as God. In other words, all of Christ's time while he was here on earth was always godlike. There was never a time that he was not godlike. You know, when you think about it, Jesus could have preached the Sermon on the Mount when he was three years old. He was always godlike. And it is simply that Jesus made a choice not to take hold of what was always and always will be his, namely his godlike properties, his nature. Explain it. Smith goes on to explain it another way. He says, imagine that you're visiting a hospital. You cannot find a parking place close to the hospital, so you park way in the back and now you're lost. And, and you stop another driver in the lot to ask directions, and he kindly says, well, you know what, I'll just park right here beside you, and I'll walk with you to where you need to be in the hospital. Now suppose that as you get to the front of the hospital, you find out that this man is actually the chief surgeon of the hospital. And as you near the door, you look down and you see his name on a parking place. He goes, oh yeah, and that's, that's my parking spot right there. You see, he had a superior advantage because of his status. The Smith says, however, in deference to your needs, he didn't take his rightful parking spot, but walked with you the whole way. So here is the question. As he was walking with you, did he stop being a doctor? Did he stop being the chief surgeon of the hospital? He never did, did he? Did he have a, have a parking place right up front that he could have parked up front? Yeah. He had all of these things and at any time could have laid hold of those things and used them. But for your sake, he just chose not to in that particular moment. He chose to walk with you to get you where you needed to go. And that's what happened when God became a man. He looked down on this earth and, and, and saw the shape that we were in and saw where we were and the, 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 poverty, the depravity of mankind. And he says, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to become one of them. It's really kind of a dummying down process. <laughs> that he left everything in glory to become one of us and walk beside us and never ceased to be God. He simply chose to lay aside his privileges as God so he could walk with you and I in our greatest need. If you want to have the life. First, believe in Jesus as God himself, God in the flesh. Secondly, believe in Jesus as your Lord and King. That's kind of tough for us because we don't live in a feudal system. You know, we, we don't address people with lords and princes and princesses and kings and queens. We, we got rid of that a long time ago. And so it's kind of tough for us to actually see Jesus 
as our Lord and our King, but it's really trusting Him to be the leader of your life. To say that Jesus is the Son of God is to say that He is King. Again, in, in Bible days, many kings had as one of their titles, Son of God. In fact, in 2 Samuel 7, God Himself says of Israel's kings, he says, I will be his father and he will be my son. 2 Samuel 7, 14. So to call Jesus the son of God means that you claim him as your king, your Lord, and the leader of your life. And what we do is actually we come to a place to where we trust Jesus to put our lives in order. That's why Jesus came, is to put our lives in order. How many of you have been trying to, you know, clean up the mess in your own life on your own? How many times do you make that effort? And to ask the Dr. Phil question, how's that working for you? Yeah, a lot of times we, you know, well, God, I don't want to bother you with this. You know, it's just something I'm struggling with. And, you know, I, you know it's just a little thing. You got, you, you know. No, it's, it's trusting Jesus to say, look, Lord, I, I need your help. Come into my heart and in my life. Clean up this mess. Because he's the only one that can take a mess and turn it into a, a message. We let him do it for us. We acknowledge, acknowledge Jesus as our Lord and we let him put our lives in order. It's the only way to have the life. You can keep kicking against the goat, as the Bible said, when Jesus was asking him, Paul, why do you keep kicking against me? Why don't you surrender and let me straighten your life out? So first, believe in Jesus as God himself. Second, believe in Jesus as your Lord and your King. And then third, believe in Jesus as your Savior. Trust Him to truly deliver you from evil. That's what the people of Israel were looking for in their their Messiah, their anointed king. They were looking for a king who would deliver them from the, the tyranny and the oppression of Rome. But Jesus came to deliver them from their sins, period. Before Jesus was born, the, the angel announced to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 21. When John the Baptist saw Jesus at the Jordan River, he announced, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world in John 1, 29. Jesus as the Son of God is God in the flesh. He is King. He is Savior. He is the only one who can deliver each one of us from the sins, from the struggles that we face on a daily basis. And so I want to encourage you today to trust him to do it for you. A lady by the name of Denise Peraza was a survivor of the 2015 San Bernardino shootings. And she recalls how Shannon Johnson saved her life by shielding her body with his own. She says, Wednesday morning at 10.55 a.m., we were seated next to each other at a table and we were joking about how we thought the large clock on the wall might be broken because time seemed to be just moving so slowly. She said, I would, I would never have guessed that only five minutes later we would be huddled next to each other under the same table using a, a fallen chair as a shield from over 60 rounds of bullets being fired across the room. And she said, well, I, I cannot recall every single second that played out that morning. I will always remember his left arm wrapped around me, holding me as close as possible next to him behind that chair. And amidst all the chaos, I'll always remember him saying three words. I got you. 
You see, that's, that's what Jesus, your God, your King, and your Savior says to you every single day. I got you. I got you. I got you. He wraps his, his arms around us and he shields us from the bullets of our own sin. And the Bible says that he himself bore our sins on his body, on the cross, on the tree. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And then he gives these words that a, a lot of faith healers love to use. He says, by his wounds, you have been healed. By his wounds, you have been healed from the sin that so easily trips us up from the struggles that we face each and every day. Can he heal us physically from disease? Absolutely. But this scripture is, is referring to how Jesus saved us and healed us from the power of our own sin nature in our lives. Trust Jesus to do it for you. Trust Jesus to save you from your sins so that you can live for him. If you want to have the life, believe in Jesus as the son of God. And that means you trust him as your God. Trust him as your king and you trust him as your savior. But don't believe in Jesus just because I tell you to do that. Believe the testimony of three very important witnesses from Scripture. The water, the blood, and the Spirit. 1 John 5, 6 through 9 says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his son. See, I can tell you all day, believe in Jesus. But my testimony is nothing pales in comparison to what God has already proclaimed about his son. On three different occasions in scripture, God himself testified that Jesus is his son. You remember when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, he was baptized by John the Baptist. John the Baptist says, Lord, it's you should be baptized in me. He says, no, you have to baptize me. This was the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. Jesus, at his death, shed his blood for each and every one of us. And then by his own spirit in our hearts, as we accept Christ into our lives, the Holy Spirit indwells us, changes us, as I always say, from the inside out. So we believe the testimony of the water. We trust the testimony of God, the Father, that God gave when Jesus was baptized. You remember the story in the Jordan River? This was the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. And that's when the, the heavens opened and a, a dove dropped down in the form of the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus. And, and in the form of a dove and the Father's voice boomed from heaven. And you remember what God said about Jesus in Matthew 3, 16 and 17. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. God himself testified that Jesus is his son in the waters of baptism. So believe the testimony of the water. 
More than that, believe the testimony of the blood. Trust the testimony of those who saw Jesus shed his blood on the cross of which, on the cross of which John was one of them. That was the end of Jesus' public ministry. And from the cross he cried. You remember what he said? It is finished. He had accomplished what God sent him to do. And at that time, at that moment, the sky turned black and an earthquake shook the earth and split the rocks and the, the curtain in the temple was ripped in two, torn from the top to the bottom, not from the bottom to the top, which is something we could have done, but from the top to the bottom that separated God from man. And it says the veil was rent from the top to the bottom. It was torn. So we had access to God at the very moment that Jesus died on the cross. When one of the soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross saw it, he said this, Truly, this was the Son of God. Just a few days before his death on the cross, Jesus cried out in public. He says, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. But for this person, purpose, and he says, Father, glorify your name and then a voice came from heaven he says I have glorified it and I will glorify it again and the crowd standing there heard it and said that it had thundered but God was speaking directly to Jesus to encourage him to say you have glorified my name you have been called for this time and this purpose and by fulfilling this, you have glorified my name and I will glorify it again. When? When Jesus walked out of the tomb. At the beginning and at the end of Jesus' ministry, God himself testified that Jesus was his son. So believe in the testimony of the water, believe in the testimony of the blood, and then believe the testimony of God's Holy Spirit Applied to your own heart, to your own inner person, not this muscle that beats in your chest, to your inner self. First John 5, 6 says, the spirit is the one who testifies because the spirit is the truth. Not might be the truth, not looks a little bit like the truth. No, the spirit is the truth. And verse 10 says, whoever believes and the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Every believer knows that Jesus is the Son of God because the Holy Spirit within us tells us so. Amen? You see, Christianity is not a blind faith. On the contrary, there is extensive evidence that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. He is God himself in the flesh, your King and your Savior from sin. That's why a, a, a man by the name of Lou Wallace, he was the governor of New Mexico and he discovered this over a century ago. He said after six years given to the impartial investigation, of Christianity as to its truth or falsity, I have come to the deliberate conclusion that Jesus Christ is the Messiah of the Jews, the Savior of the world, and my personal Savior. How did he get there? I want you to listen to his story. He says, Lou Wallace started out to write a book disproving the existence of Jesus Christ, but in the process came to believe that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. Wallace had a, a good friend by the name of Robert C. Ingersoll. Ingersoll was a, a famous agnostic. And Ingersoll 
challenged Wallace. He said, see here, Wallace, you are a learned man and a thinker. Why don't you gather material and write a book to prove the falsity concerning Jesus Christ? That no such man has ever lived, much less the author of the teachings found in the New Testament. Such a book would make you famous. It would be a masterpiece and a, a way of putting an end to the foolishness about this so-called Christ. And the thought made a, a deep impression on Wallace. So he told his wife what he had intended to do. His wife was a member of the Methodist Church. Amen, Bobby. <laughs> and she didn't like his plan at all. But Wallace decided to pursue it anyway. And he began to collect material from libra libraries in the United States and in Europe covering the period in which Jesus Christ, according to legend, should have lived. He spent several years working on the project and had written nearly four chapters when it became clear to him that Jesus Christ was just as real a personality as Socrates, Plato, or Caesar. The conviction became a certainty and, and Wallace said, I knew that Jesus Christ had lived because of the facts connected with the period in which he lived. And so he found himself in a, a very uncomfortable position. He had begun to write this book to prove that Jesus Christ had never lived on earth. And now he was face to face with the fact that Jesus was just as historic a, a personage as Julius Caesar, as Mark Antony, as Virgil, as Dante, and a host of other men who had lived in that period in the past. Wallace asked himself candidly, he says, okay, if Jesus was a real person, and there was no doubt he had extensive evidence, and, and was not then also, was he not also the Son of God and the Savior of the world? And gradually, Wallace came to believe that since Jesus Christ was a real person, he probably was the one he claimed to be. At that point, Wallace fell on his knees to pray for the first time in his life. He asked God to reveal himself to him, to forgive his sins, and to help him become a follower of Christ. And Wallace says, towards morning, the, the light broke into my soul. And he said, I went into my bedroom and I woke my wife and I, I told her that I had received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And his wife says, oh, Lou, I've prayed for this ever since you told me of your purpose to write this book that you would find him while you wrote it and that's exactly what happened Lou Wallace changed the book he was originally writing and he used all of his research to write another book later the book became a movie it starred Charlton Heston those of you who have seen the movie can't can ever forget the scene where he races four magnificent white horses in an amazing chariot race. The movie, of course, has been her. The story of a Roman soldier who, like Wallace, had come to believe that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. Isn't that a powerful story? The question is, will you believe it too? Will you believe that Jesus really is who he says he is? That he is our God in the flesh, that he is our Lord and our King and our Savior? On the basis of solid evidence and testimony, will you trust Jesus as your God, your King, 
your Savior. You see, once you believe this, then the second important step that you have to take, live. Trust Christ with your life and then you can have the life. Depend on Christ as your Lord and Savior and then you can really live. Put your faith in Christ and live forever. 1 John 5, 11 says, And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in His Son. Find eternal life in God's Son. You see, I don't know how those who have no faith in Christ deal with death. I, I, just, I don't know how they deal with that. Certainly not very well. My friend Tagi that we've been praying for, 48 years old, he was ready to meet the Lord. He had already settled all that. He had a peace about him, ready to face Jesus Christ. He had the life. A Canadian humorist named uh, Stephen Leacock says this. He says, all ends with the cancellation of forces and comes to nothing. And our universe thus ends in one vast, silent, unappreciated joke. Well, for those of us who believe in Jesus as the Son of God, life is not a joke. We have the assurance of eternal life, so believe and live forever. More than that, believe and live fully. When you trust Christ with your life, you can live a full and a meaningful life right now, starting today, this very moment. You can rely on Jesus as your God, your King, and your Savior, and you can have life today. 1 John 5, 12, whoever has the Son has the life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have the life. It's that simple. Those who have Jesus have the life. Those that don't have Jesus don't have the life. I want to close with some verses in 1 John 5, 18, 21. And I want you to listen to this. It says in verse 18, We are sure that God's children do not keep on sinning. What? <laughs> we, we are sure that God's children do not keep on sinning. It's God's own son protects him and the devil cannot harm him. We are certain that we come from God and that the rest of the world is under, under the power of the devil. We know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has come and has shown us the true God. And because of Jesus, we now belong to the true God who gives eternal life. And the last verse says, children, you must stay away from idols. And so I want to ask you this morning, what are the idols in your life? What do you keep worshiping and hanging on to and thinking that it's so much better than a relationship with Jesus Christ, a true, a real, a daily relationship? What are the struggles that keep tripping you up? You see, after we are born again, we have two different natures. We have the old sinful nature, and then we have a new sinless nature. And we have a sinless spiritual side and a sinful fleshly side. And from the moment of our salvation, we discover that these two inner natures are at constant conflict with each other. And the Bible tells us that the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh lusts against the spirit. In other words, the sinless part of our nature continues throughout our life to be in opposition to the sinful part of our nature and vice versa. Does that make sense? The Apostle Paul himself identified this dilemma in Romans chapter 7. In verse 15, he says, in fact, I don't understand why I act the way I do. I don't do what I know is right, and I do the things that I hate. And later on in Romans 7, 25, Paul cried out. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin, from this old sin nature that I was born with? And then he gives this amazing answer. He says, thank God, Jesus Christ 
will rescue me. I want you to get that. I've heard a lot of teachers and preachers and Christians who feel like they've achieved this Christ likeness in such a way that they live their lives and they never sin. And then if you sin, well, what's wrong with you? Is <laughs> should be able to live like I do. I mean, of course. I live a sinless life. I'm perfect in every way. In my humble opinion, of course. <laughs> no. Paul knew. Paul knew that there were two forces fighting against each other. And praise God that Jesus is the answer to sin. Amen. Amen. The person who has been born of God is protected by the Son of God. Who has given us His life as our ransom price. So that the evil one cannot harm us. Can the evil one oppress us? Can he come against us? Absolutely. Can he mess with your mind and plant thoughts in there? You better believe it. I have them on a daily basis. <laughs> but today, all of us can rejoice. All that have accepted Christ can rejoice that we've received the sinless nature of Christ. By grace, through faith, we have believed. And in that nature, when we are living in that nature, the sinless nature of Christ, we cannot sin. However, when we do sin, by allowing the, the old sinful nature to climb down from the place of death and reestablish its influence, over our lives, which it can do. <gasps> the Bible tells us that we also have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Jesus, the mediator between man and God and between God and man. I thank God for his grace towards each one of us. Amen. Amen. The Bible says where, where, where sin goes deep, grace goes even deeper. And we cannot outgive the grace of God. We cannot get to a place to where we are so far gone that we cannot still be touched by the grace of God. It's impossible. If you've accepted Jesus, as your God, as your Lord and King, as your Savior. The Bible says the enemy has no struggle over you. He can't take any real estate except what we give up to him. That's his promise. My prayer is that, that we keep our old sin nature, our old man, in the place of death. Let's keep him nailed to the cross. By allowing our new nature to live godly in Christ Jesus, who is our life. Believe and live. Two very important steps. Believe and live. Surrender to Jesus as your God, your King, and your Savior. Have the life. Amen? Amen. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, again, we thank you for the power of your word and the, the truths that we see when we just take time to read it. And not only read it and getting it in our head, but Lord, being able to move it about 18 inches south to our hearts. That we may adopt this way of living to live out Jesus in us not just that our, our ticket is checked for a ride to heaven but that we become world changers because of Christ in us there are so many people who need to experience this kind of love so many people who choose hatred 
over the love of friendship. Who choose violence over peaceful reconciliation. Who choose so many different paths, but the only path that will lead them to a fulfilled life. And now to you who can do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can even think or imagine according to the power that is within us. Lord, we pray that you empower us and encourage us in that way. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 God bless y'all.